Hi everyone, it's great to be here virtually. My name is Rakaya and this is my colleague Richard. We both serve as administrators for Rutgers Arts Online. We are a fully online division and part of Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers University. We offer fully online courses in all the different visual and performing arts disciplines at Mason Gross, which includes art and design, dance, filmmaking, music, and theater. The online courses are developed for the non-major and we serve approximately 10,000 students each academic year. We will be talking today about academic integrity tools we use in our division. And this is critical as we go through final exams and especially now as most institutions have moved instruction online. So let me introduce the tools we have available. We are going to focus on Canvas as that is what we use, but these tools are pretty standard for most learning management systems, but may be under a different name or different way to access them. You may have to just explore if you are using a different LMS. The tools available for instructors to review if cheating has occurred include the exam action log and the access report. And the tools available for administrators to verify a claim of cheating include the user detail page views and the application program interface log or API. Our division is organized so that there are dedicated academic integrity facilitators or as we call them AIFs. The role of the AIF includes double checking all claims of cheating so that there are only valid cases going forward and to assure that sanctions are applied appropriate to the violation. What we are trying to prevent is our instructors from being either too harsh or too lenient in a cheating case and to ensure that sanctions are uniformly and fairly applied across our division. Now I will turn it over to Richard. Hello. The first tool which is available to the instructor is the exam action log. This is available in the speed grader. It lists the time, uh, the times that the um, student is either answering questions or pausing or um, whatever during the exam. Uh, at the top of the slide, you'll see a round red circle with an X that indicates that the viewer has stopped. Um, that could mean one of two things, that the student is either uh, surfed away from the exam, but it could also mean that there's a timeout. The timeout uh, period, I believe, is about 30 seconds. So if a student stops to um, ponder what he's going to write, he or she is going to write for an essay question, then that red X could very uh, likely appear. Most of the time when you go through, uh, you'll see that there's a, a pretty uniform time passage between the, the answering of questions. It's only when you have long periods out that uh, sus suspicions should be raised. In the case uh, on the slide before us, we see that the student has stopped viewing at 3147. And then uh, there's a series of uh, stamps indicating that the viewing has stopped and resumed. In this case, the time between the first stop is 3147 and the time that the student actually answers the question is 3402. So that's three minutes. That's a long, a long time out. The fact that the student is stopping and then resuming and stopping and resuming almost would seem to indicate that the student is reviewing the question um, in order to find the specific answer that's needed. Uh, so long periods in which there's inactivity should raise red flags for the instructor. Um, there is a way, however, where these logs become uh, very valuable. Uh, if a, an instructor suspects that uh, two students are, have colluded on their examinations, uh, that would be, of course, determined or detected the old fashioned way. For example, the instructor reads the answer to an essay question and then a little while later reads the same answer. Um, then the instructor can pull up the logs and compare them. In the comparison before us on this slide, we see that the, uh, the time stamps, one student starts at 1955, the other one starts at 1952, but that the order of questions and roughly the same times uh, are, are followed all the way through. This is a very clear indication that 
uh, the students have not been exactly forthright in taking their exams and should prompt the instructor to um, escalate this. If there are other uh, suspicions, then the instructor can also go to the access page log. Uh, this has to be done immediately after the exam. Uh, the more time that passes, the more this log becomes less clear. Here we see at the top that the midterm exam was started at 1247. For this presentation, we'll assume that the exam started at noon. And we see then uh, the third row, the fourth row, the fifth row, seventh row, the eighth row, the ninth row, the tenth row are all page visits. And these page visits occurred in the, the time period that, that the student took the exam. This is also a very clear indication that the student has gone surfing, looking for answers. Um, the problem with this uh, log, however, is that if the student visits any of these pages subsequently, what will happen is only the most recent visit will be recorded. So if the instructor doesn't get to this log for a week, he might find uh, or she might find that the midterm exam has had six visits and only the latest date will appear. Should the student visit any of these pages, then the timestamps will also change, and that renders this pretty useless. So uh, this is a tool which has to be used almost immediately. Should a case go up to the AIF, um, then the AIF can, can visit the application and program interface logs, the API, uh, this is what an API log looks like. It's an Excel spreadsheet. The, uh, the sheet is, is too wide for me to have presented this on a single slide and still have it readable. So I made two rows. Column C shows the page visits uh, within the course. And in this case, what we're looking at is just navigation. Column K gives us the date stamp on it. And N gives us the uh, the browser. Now, the Apple Kit is actually software which reconciles the various technical features of the various browsers so that all of them can, can access the Canvas site. Usually, the first one on the list is the one that's being used, but if you see Apple Kit like Gecko, you, you don't need to worry about Chrome and Safari um, because they're, they're just being listed as, as uh, browsers, which could be accommodated. It's, as I say, it's usually the first. In column S, we see the IP address. That's generally not important, though it could be. Uh, in a case that we had some time back, there was a cheating ring, and we found that six students in a row took their exams, and they were all from the same IP address, and they were all back-to-back. -back. So in that case, it was important, but most of the time, uh, it's not as effective as the, the URL. The problem with the API is very similar to that of the action log in that the uh, action log um, will change with time and so will the API. Only a certain uh, number of page hits will be preserved. If you need to access the API, instantly you would do it from the page views, the CSV over in the upper right hand corner, if you click on that. Let's assume uh, that only 50 page hits, uh, starting with the most recent, are preserved. If the uh, instructor does not get to the API and the student has continued to be active, then those timestamps, which occurred during the exam, might have been basically pushed down by the other visits and out of storage. However, the, the uh, details page views is, uh, is comprehensive. It's, it's harder to read and it doesn't give as much information, but it will preserve everything that the student has done throughout the semester. Now, uh, there's usually a lot of information you can see on this slide. What we have is, is uh, basically navigation items. Okay, the, uh, so we don't need to, to present all of this when we prepare a case to go to the Office of Student Conduct. So here's what we do. Here's what a typical submission would look like. The first column is the URL. The second is the date. The third is the, uh, the browser. And the fourth is the IP. This is an interesting case. As I said before, it doesn't matter how many uh, computing devices are used to hit the site. All of them will be recorded. 
In this case, in the bottom two rows, or the bottom row, we can see that the student started with Mozilla. If a student opens the exam in Mozilla and does not navigate away from the exam, then there won't be any timestamps other than the one at the very top row, which says quizzes, and that is the submission stamp. So the, first, the bottom one is the start and the top is the finish. We can see several minutes into the exam that the student has decided that, or has figured that uh, Proctor Track in this case, which was running, will not show any page searches if, if the second device is used. So the student has logged on using Android. Well, that appears. And we can see in between the start and the stop um, that the, the student has been visiting pages. Pages, what is black music and academic perspective? Uh, pages, glossary musical terms. Uh, pages, chart topping, big bands. I'm reading from the bottom. And so it goes. And so we see then also with the uh, IP, Mozilla is hitting on one address and Android is hitting on the other, but they're both consistent. These logs are accurate. This is, is proof beyond a doubt that the student has cheated. So if we go forward with this case, then it's, it's, not, it's not a line call. We, we don't run the risk of, of accusing a student of something that he or she didn't do. Rakaya? Right, so a uh, fair warning to our students. First of all, we don't attempt to hide any of the tools and we are very transparent about the tools we use for academic integrity insurance. There are multiple reasons for this. It's a proactive approach to discourage cheating. This also helps us avoid legal issues and avoids those gotcha moments. We post these warnings in the syllabus in our course homepage under our academic honesty policy as well as the landing pages of all of our high stakes assessments, as well as reminders through instructor announcements prior to any exams. So students have multiple opportunities to familiarize themselves with our expectations. In our division, we rely upon our instructors to do the initial analysis if there is a potential violation. These are then escalated up to the academic integrity facilitators for verification, and the AIFs use these administrative tools and verify beyond a doubt the results. As Richard and I are both the AIFs for our division, we forward only cases to the Office of Student Conduct in which evidence is compelling and accurate. The reason for this level of review is to ensure that we're not accusing a student of cheating when it actually hasn't occurred. A false accusation could have serious implications for their life during and after the degree, as well as for our division. The fact is, with the type of data and tools for fully online courses, it gives us the ability to investigate and adjudicate more thoroughly and accurately over face-to-face -face courses. For example, in the fall, we concluded 18 cases using proctoring software or API of approximately 4,200 students in our division. In fall, our exam cheating rate was 0.4%, and that would be despite all the tools we have. We are very judicious in using API and only go there when there is strong evidence. We believe our low cheating rate is the result of the various tools we use and our transparency in using them. And we have found that our procedures have not impacted our enrollment since most students understand that these tools actually help to protect their credentials. Uh, we want to thank you so much for attending our virtual presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us. Thank you.